the Walt Disney Corporation. Oh man, what a legacy. Unironically, their catalog of wonderful, timeless films in their animation department knows no bounds for any kid living within the past century. And by now, almost everyone knows the name just for how much stuff they own. They got Marvel, Lucasfilm, Fox, Hulu, Pixar. They're so spread out that they make up about 40% of all box office revenue nowadays, and that can be somewhat of a scary thought in capitalism. There will always be rules and regulations to keep Disney from getting too much stake in the entertainment industry, but they'll never be afraid to toe the line as long as they aren't stepping over it. In all honesty, over the years, some could claim Disney made their childhoods even more than Butch Hartman. A scary idea, I know. And with such a big company comes quite a few controversies. Yeah, for a brand that explicitly markets itself around being magical and full of whimsy, Disney has not had the best track record on many fronts over the years, and especially within the past decade. It's sort of like those people that constantly like to brag about how much good stuff they do when they're just a bunch of assholes, like, oh, hi there, I'm Mr. Donate to charity and I give to the homeless and ooh, my name's Ellen DeGeneres. I've already been pretty vocal about my disdain for some of the company's less than stellar practices, but after my video on another company relating to something I'm passionate about, Funimation, did really well, I saw a door of opportunity for this open up. I grew up on Disney VHSs like most kids in the 2000s, so the company did have a big part to play in my love for art and animation. I was a junkie for the films, and I even watched the direct to video movies unironically at one point. That's why it was so hard for me to accept that Disney had gone downhill as a company pretty fast over time. Yeah, they still make good animated movies, though Pixar does most of the heavy lifting for the company nowadays, but in almost every other industry they seem to have a list of fuck-ups. Before you guys in the comments say it though, and yes I know you are, I'm not talking about any of the theories about Disney from decades back, I'm not talking about how Walt Disney was supposedly a racist, or an anti-Semite, or had his head frozen in a pickle jar under Cinderella's castle, or whatever the hell that one rumor is. I want to talk about Disney in the here and now, because too many people are unaware of all the shit they do and get away with nowadays as a company, and maybe seeing all this laid out will get people to ask for more from such a massive corporation. Firstly, let's talk about a little something called greed. Disney has kind of been oversaturating the market in several different franchises after subsequently buying them out for over a decade now. It's basically become their main trademark at this point, which people like to mock them for. Let's talk superhero films as an example. Back in the day, superhero movies weren't necessarily a niche, but they were certainly less interconnected and by a wider array of studios. There was also much more room for artistic interpretation, with a variety of tones, visions, and directing styles that made for plenty of unique experiences. The Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy has a camp and sense of humor to it that not many other movies took pride in at the time. The Yang Li Hulk movie was weird as fuck, but only Yang Li could have made it. I could really go on, but you get my point. There was a much different philosophy for making hero movies before the 2010s. That all changed when Disney decided to take the reins of Marvel Studios and make an at-the-time risky decision. Have all your superhero movies be interconnected in one way or another to eventually come together into a massive blockbuster. That movie would come out after about four years of films with the release of the Avengers. At the time, it was one of the highest grossing films ever made, and people loved seeing everything together. Unfortunately, on the road to doing so, Disney didn't exactly create a full catalog of memorable movies to back it up. I mean, in the grand scheme of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, it feels like a necessity to watch them all to get the big, overarching story. But when was the last time you decided to sit down and watch Thor? Remember Thor? How about The Incredible Hulk? Iron Man 2? Yeah, I, I didn't think so. The original Iron Man is great, and Captain America was okay, but considering just how many movies were released in that time, most of them felt more like obligations than legit movie-going experiences that had a specific director's vision, and that only kind of continues to this day. I wouldn't watch Thor 2, either of the Ant-Man movies, Black Panther, or Captain Marvel if I didn't feel obligated to. Sure, when these are all brought together for movies like Infinity War and Endgame, it feels earned, but so much of what you have to watch to get to that conclusion is just subpar. It can really only be expected with just how many movies they were pumping out at the time, usually having two or so a year and over 26 now. Thanks to Disney, Warner Bros. and a few other smaller companies have been trying to take the same route with a cinematic universe, and considering how much is being turned out at such a rapid rate, it seems almost inevitable that the subgenre as a whole is on its way to going out of style. A reason for the subpar quality of so many of their films could just be Disney's restrictions on what directors can do for these kinds of projects. There needs to be a certain amount of conformity to the Disney style 
while if you want the film to come out. And that raises the question of why hire directors in the first place if they can't give a unique spin on the aforementioned project. Among Disney franchises, the MCU is probably the least bad of these, with James Gunn and Taika Waititi having the ability to add some more of their own style to their films, but other directors like Edgar Wright didn't get that experience. He worked on getting an Ant-Man movie out for several years, and his style is iconic, but Ant-Man does not feel like an Edgar Wright movie. As quoted by him in an interview, the most diplomatic answer is, I wanted to make a Marvel movie, but I don't think they really wanted to make an Edgar Wright movie. That really sums it up quite well. Many Marvel movies are fun to watch, or at least aren't bad per se, but they don't have much memorability on their own like older superhero movies did. They're all installments in a franchise, and it'll play out how Disney wants them to, usually in a safe way. And if you want longevity in the public eye, you gotta switch things up. Joker and Deadpool are good examples of that. They're much more extreme and experimental, and would you look at that, it paid off for them. Disney probably still won't listen to that criticism, however, because the conformity standards and corporate bullshit gets a lot worse, even in a galaxy far, far away. Star Wars is a pretty big franchise. It's been through its ups and downs, but the series has always found a way to position itself in popular culture, whether through film, TV shows, novels, comic books, or action figures. It's famously known that George Lucas gave up on a huge pay raise for directing the film as long as he could get 100% merchandising rights and rights to all sequels. This would prove to be a genius move, as after the film became a hit, kids were so hyped up for the toys that weren't even manufactured yet to where they would get excited over receiving gift vouchers on Christmas for when the toys were actually made. Lucas got a ton of cash out of the deal, and the Star Wars series was generally regarded as having high quality toys that every kid would want. This even carried over to the prequels. Whether adults found them good or not, kids loved it and still bought plenty of action figures and lightsabers. From a business standpoint, it makes complete sense that Disney would like to capitalize off of that for their films. In fact, they were a little bit too trigger happy with the idea. Another factor you need to consider with the Star Wars movies is that they were quite spaced out between each other. Looking at the release date, for the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy, it's consistent, one film every three years. It's a good strategy because it gives time for consumers to cool down from the last film, build up hype, and not come across as though the market is too full. For the Disney trilogy, it was a bit different, shortening the distance between films to two years. That doesn't seem so bad, but then we have to take into account the side movies. Okay, so now it's once or so every year. We also need to think about the TV shows related to it that were also airing. That includes Rebels, The Freemaker Adventures, and Resistance. Taking all of that into account, and the fact that Disney was consistently pumping out toys for all of these at once, what do you think happened? massive oversaturation. At one point, there were plans for Disney to swarm even more Star Wars side movies into their schedule, almost in an attempt to make it the next Marvel, but after Solo did poorly, a lot of those plans fizzled out or were changed to TV show ideas. If you were there for Star Wars during this time, you could tell how the magic was kind of lost with the fans a little bit. Looking back at all the old Star Wars premieres, including the prequels, there's not only moviegoers here, but a genuine community of geeks that take the opportunity to really make it an event. They kind Cosplayed, brought portable TVs and game systems, the news media would show up to cover it. It was always something to behold. I remember my first Star Wars going experience for The Force Awakens when I was 11. It was the same scene as any other Star Wars premiere, with people jammed into the theater wearing cosplays and all that. It was great. As I went to see subsequent movies time after time, though, I saw this crowd of people dissipate vastly. The film still raked in quite a lot of cash, but it saw noticeably diminishing returns as it went. Audience scores on sites like Rotten Tomatoes also reflect this, though in many cases they'd actually delete user scores to give it a higher rating. People were starting to get sick with all the Star Wars being jammed down their throats, and the merchandising didn't help. Like I said, Disney had a lot to merchandise over the years they made for all the shit they were creating at the time, and the problem was, people weren't buying nearly as much as they were stocking. The Star Wars Blade Builder sets were a big thing they pushed for, but you could find dozens upon hundreds of them not sold at any local Targets or Toys R Us's. The same thing went for all the new characters. The amount of Rogue One's Solo and Last Jedi toys filling up landfills by now is laughable. Even when they brought back the old characters for toys, people were leaving them on shelves. Even toy executives from Hasbro, Diamond Toys, and Toys R Us before they were gone stated that there was no demand for the toys at all. Even when Toys R Us was going bankrupt, they couldn't sell the toys. A lot of it did just come down to overpricing, if we're being real. Disney had two main sets of toys for their main trilogy, and one of those was the Black Series, meant for the true collectors. 
Worlds. Originally, they sold from $25 to $30 each, all for a single action figure. It only took a week or so for stores to drop the price down to $10 or even $5 when it came to solo toys. A lot of the products Disney was pushing just weren't worth the price, and kids weren't interested. They took a booming market and made it look like something you'd only buy if there was no other option because there's just so much of it. There's still money to be made in the industry a little bit, but other than Baby Yoda, the demand for Star Wars toys has dried up all thanks to Disney's mega oversaturation. Last thing to mention for Star Wars is that the movies had absolutely no plan from the beginning, and it shows in how everything was executed. I don't mean they didn't have a plan for when the movies were going to be released, they wanted to release tons and tons of movies, but they just didn't have any plans for the story whatsoever. That's why so much of the story feels like it was thought up on the fly, especially Rise of Skywalker. Like for Marvel, Disney wanted to appeal to the fans with their Star Wars trilogy so they could make bundles and bundles of cash. The Force Awakens is basically New Hope with mostly less interesting characters in modern pretty pictures. It's a nice looking movie, but the substance just isn't there. It was mostly about J.J. Abrams making a bunch of mystery boxes to be opened at a later date. Who are Rey's parents? Who's Snoke? What's Rey's origin story? How did Maz Kanata or whoever the fuck get Luke's lightsaber? Why was Luke on a deserted planet? All to be answered later. Rogue One was probably the best thing that came out of the Disney movies. It gave realism to the series that had been lacking, and since it was a side story, it had much more creative freedom. For The Last Jedi, they kinda just gave Ryan Johnson the reins to open all of JJ's mystery boxes for the fans, and he basically just said, fuck it. Who are Rey's parents? Nobody. What's her origin story? She got sold off by some randos. Who's Snoke? I don't know. He, he died before he could do anything. Why was Luke on a deserted planet? He thought about killing his nephew because he had bad thoughts, and then he basically quit on his entire ideology because of it. How did Maz get Luke's lightsaber? A great Good question, question for, for another, another time. time. That's code for, it's never been brought up again. Since Disney hadn't planned the series out like they did for Marvel, Ryan basically went against everything JJ was doing so he could subvert expectations. On another minor note of controversy, after Last Jedi release, there was Solo, which was originally going to be directed by Phil Lord and Chris Miller, but because of, quote, creative differences, they were removed for Yes Man Ron Howard, who just created another movie which fans did not like. Not necessarily because the film was bad, just because it was very standard, and therefore it felt like the film were being milked for all they could by Disney, and with all the backlash from Last Jedi, Disney got a bit scared because they didn't want to anger fans anymore after Solo performed badly at the box office. To try and remedy this, they thought the best way to fix this would be by removing the current director of Rise of Skywalker and giving it to JJ so he could damage control. Originally, the sequel trilogy was supposed to have each film contain a different director's vision, but when that didn't work out for them, Disney tried to play it safe, and JJ did not deliver. I think I speak for most people when I say that the Rise of Skywalker was a gimmicky fanfiction level mess that did nothing but try to combat the damage Last Jedi did. I won't go into it, but needless to say, the sequel trilogy just feels like two guys writing a story at the same time and rewriting the other story out of spite when they get the chance. This is what happens when you run into a series with your dick first, only thinking about the money you're gonna make. This isn't the end, either. After the sequel trilogy, there's planned to be a full new trilogy by Ryan Johnson. That sounds like a great idea. There will be a Taika Waititi Star Wars movie, a Kevin Feig Star Wars movie, movie, some other random ass Star Wars movie, and on TV, I don't even know how you're gonna keep up. The Mandalorian, The Bad Batch, Lando, Ahsoka, The Book of Boba Fett, Rangers of the New Republic, The Acolyte, Andor! Remember Cassie and Andor from Rogue One? Yeah, me neither. He's got a show though. If there's anything to take from this section, it's that Disney will shamelessly milk a cash cow until it's dry with no plan in mind, not really caring about artistic freedom, as they throw Rose Tico toys at you hoping one will snag a dollar from your wallet. Speaking of badly done representation, a lot of modern Disney. A common practice you may be seeing with recent Disney films in the news is that they love to drum up publicity whenever it comes to adding specific representation in film, and on its most basic level, that doesn't sound like a problem at all. Having a diverse cast of characters is perfectly fine on its own, but how Disney goes about implementing this is a little bit less than desirable in many instances. For instance, Disney loves advertising about how their films of female leads are about strong, independent women who don't need no man. Captain Marvel is a good example. They pushed hard to make Carol Danvers the most badass, sassy, powerful woman possible to where they literally have a character say that for them in the film itself. You were smart and funny and a huge pain in the ass. And you were the most powerful person I knew. It's so unsubtle in these themes that as Carol was having a flashback once, she literally had a male character say to her, You do know why they call it a cockpit. Don't you? All these unsettled moves wouldn't even bother me as much if she was an interesting character, like, at all. 
When I said they pushed for her to be badass, sassy, and powerful, they kind of forgot to give her anything else. A good, developed character can have those attributes if they want, but they also need to have plenty of flaws to keep them human, and have reasons for why they act the way that they do. That's why Tony Stark is a beloved character. He too is snarky and powerful, but the reason that he is like that is because he wants to cover up his deep emotional insecurities and childhood trauma which have caused him to be very cold and unfeeling. He constantly drinks and parties to try and cover up the guilt he has from making weapons of mass destruction which are used by terrorists. That's a flawed character. Carol Danvers only struggle is that the patriarchy is holding her down and she can't use her full strength. Oh my, what an interesting character. I mentioned this in my Mulan video, but Disney movies about empowering young women nowadays seem to only focus on the most superficial aspects of that. They make characters like Captain Marvel, Rey from Star Wars, Mulan and the remake all physically strong, but they have almost no personality or are as basic as possible. Without a struggle, weakness, character flaw, whatever, the character isn't interesting to watch. What's funny is that Disney used to be much better at crafting strong, independent female characters without shoving it in your face about it or making the characters hollow shells. I bring up my old video again. The original Mulan was noble, intelligent, and determined, but they didn't make you think that by having Li Shang walk up to her and be like, Mulan, you are the strongest, independentist, womanist I have ever met. Because they didn't treat their audience like idiots and instead let her actions speak for herself. She wasn't perfect either. She was clumsy, sometimes airheaded, and on many occasions didn't think everything through. But that added to her character and made her seem more real. Jasmine from Aladdin is another good example. She's brave, daring, and unafraid to speak her mind. But she's also reckless and gets into trouble easy. These are good characters that don't need to have a leg up on everyone else with mystical superpowers to do shit in the film. And actually, you know, I say used to, but they still have good female protagonists in their animated movies such as Vanellope Von Schweetz or Moana, but for some reason they just cannot stick the landing with any of their live action movies. And back on the superpowers, that's another weird thing these three versions of characters I mentioned have in common. Captain Marvel just got a gamma blast and after letting loose was on par with Thanos. Rey became a master at the force after barely being trained. Mulan literally has superpower abilities that were never in any other version of the film but were put in the remake for whatever reason. While characters like the original Mulan embody that anyone, regardless of sex or family can do anything, the other three examples basically say that if you want to be on par with anyone else, it's gotta be in the genes or by freak accident. Otherwise, you'll never succeed. Women. At least those films actually go through with what they advertise and have clearly woman characters that are majorly important to the film. But yeah, you can probably tell where I'm going with this. Let's talk about queer baiting a little bit. In its most basic terms, queer baiting refers to when a piece of media will hint at or nudge that a character or group of characters is part of the LGBT, but never really explicitly states that in any meaningful way. The first instance of this occurred when the media was hyping up that the live-action remake of Beauty and the Beast would have an LGBT character in the form of Leifu. Going beyond how hilarious it is that Disney decided to have their first apparently open LGBT character's name literally translate to The Fool in French, this was completely bullshit. I guess you could say that LeFou had a few commonly seen as gay mannerisms, but it's a musical. Everyone is like that. The only moment that's ever even slightly Slightly hinting at LGBT for LeFou is at the very end of the film when this happens. Oh, uh, sorry, did you miss that? Yeah, most people did because it lasted for like two seconds. While LeFou was dancing, he ended up with another man for a few seconds. It doesn't come off as romantic, barely anyone would notice, it, it's nothing. So much for openly LGBT, disregarding that it would most likely be seen as heresy in 1700s France. This isn't the only instance either. The same publicity happened for the first openly gay Pixar character and Officer What's Her Face from Onward. She appears in the film for like three minutes and one of her lines just subtly says something about her girl girlfriend's kids. Another nothing. Last example, the first openly gay Star Wars kiss. You can tell that the media loves using the word first ever openly gay to make these things seem like much larger events. You think for such a massive news campaign it would be one of the main characters doing that? Ah, uh, no. Random's off to the background. Unfortunately for all the people that would ever want to see Disney portray an openly LGBT main or even side character in a movie, it's not gonna happen. There's a simple reason for it too. China. It's no secret that China is a massive heavy hitter in box office returns. Specifically, they're usually the second biggest in the world besides the US, so Disney loves to take measures to appease them. One of those measures is that of the gay. China does not like the gay. They didn't even allow gay people to have sex with one another until 1997. Therefore, having an openly LGBT character in America may be marketable, but in China, they don't like it as much, so Disney tries to have their cake and eat it too. They want to play to both sides. They give these tiny 
tiny, minuscule, non-existent roles for gay people in their movies to get social brownie points in news articles in the US, but because they are so non-existent or lacking for the Chinese release, they can just snip it out if it behooves them. Another thing they like downplaying is a particular race of people which China also doesn't like so much black people. It's no secret China has had a constant flow of discrimination against black people for a long time, and there are still plenty of instances today. Like I said before, Disney wants to play to the Chinese market, so what do you think they did for posters which featured black characters? Well, for The Force Awakens, they just made Finn super noticeably tiny on the poster despite his big role. I think Disney actually learned from this mistake, as for every subsequent Star Wars sequel, Finn was much smaller, making it so the Chinese poster wouldn't even need to be changed. As for Black Panther, which I don't know know if you ever knew this, has a large black cast, they just poorly covered it all up with masks because they couldn't even be bothered to be subtle after that first fiasco. While we're still on the topics of race in China, I might as well give a summarized version of the little rant I had near the end of my Mulan video, where if you were there for it, I got just a little bit steamed for a few reasons. First of all, considering all that I just showed for how Disney likes to pander to Chinese audiences, they sure didn't get many new fans in the country with this movie. Most of that stemmed from how the film botched Chinese culture, the story of Hua Mulan, and added cultural beats that were never recognized in Chinese folklore. China literally banned people from speaking about the film negatively, and it still got haters. So that says a lot considering the totalitarian nature of China as a country. Secondly, and much more importantly, some of the action scenes for the movie were filmed near Yigur internment camps in China with the country's help and approval to secure the location. Disney even thanked some of the propaganda agencies involved for helping them film there. For anyone that doesn't know, Yigurs are a large prosecuted Muslim group in China which the government has been trying to systematically make smaller. One of their methods is internment camps that hold over 1 million people today, and in many cases males will be forcefully sterilized. It's gotten so bad to the point what China's been doing could be classified as genocide, and Disney thanked people involved with that. They had the audacity to inadvertently support genocide all so that they could get a few more shots for their shitty remake that already had several obvious sets. Just Wow. Finally, let me tell you a little something about the lead actress playing Mulan, Liu Yafei. She said on social media that she supports the police in the Hong Kong protests and sarcastically mocked the people of Hong Kong. Basically, what's happening there is that Hong Kong was a part of China under British rule till the mid-90s, where they were given 50 years before having to convert their laws and rules back to regular old China, but until then they could have the same laws and rights as British citizens until 2047. Back in 2019 or so, however, China started implementing shit way too early early, so people fought back because their rights were being infringed, and the police have been excessively brutal with those protesters. You'd think Disney would step in here and get rid of Yafei for basically going against everything Mulan stood for, but they decided not to because... I don't think they ever even really gave a statement just because. This is a big pile of hypocrisy on Disney's part though, thanks to them firing a director by the name of James Gunn. For anyone that doesn't know, James Gunn is the director of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, and he's been known to have a kind of juvenile dark sense of humor in what he's written, such as Super, The Belko Experiment, and the game Lollipop Chainsaw. It's an easily recognizable aspect of his work, but some people just don't understand what jokes are. By this I mean that over 10 years ago, he made some jokes relating to quote, pedophilia on Twitter and despite apologizing and deleting these incredibly old tweets, Disney decided to let him go for it. It's even more ridiculous if you look at the tweets people are pointing to. Like, oh my, how vulgar. This hotel shower is the weakest ever. Felt like a three-year-old peeing on my head. Retweet at whoever. I remember my first Nambla meeting. It was the first time I felt okay being who I am. Some of these guys are still my BFFs. Retweet someone else. I like it when little boys touch me my silly place. Shh. Can you not tell these are jokes? I really don't even know how the first one could be construed as sexual or relating to quote pedophilia in literally any way, and the other two are supposed to be mocking people by saying that he's retweeting them saying it. Disney didn't really care though, and because people were getting mad at James Gunn on Twitter, they decided to let him go. Unfortunately for Disney, since James Gunn is well liked, Warner Bros swooped in real quick to let him direct the next Suicide Squad movie. Fans were also really upset since the firing would mean he wouldn't direct the next Guardians film. So then 
then Disney rehired him, and in the end, it only really helped him. I think this is what we in the biz call getting your just desserts. You do gotta think though, they were willing to get rid of James Gunn for so little because Twitter got kinda mad, but they have the star of their live action remake currently stating shit against basic human decency and undermining the entire message of the film. Yeah, let's keep her on. The film's already started production. That isn't nearly the end of their hypocrisy either. Have you ever heard of this thing called copyrights? It used to be a pretty simple concept. A company or person creates characters for movies, TV shows, books, stories, and they get to have ownership of said characters. Makes sense. If someone else uses your intellectual property in a non-transformative way, you can sue them to make the money that's rightfully yours. That wasn't where copyright used to end, however. The idea of copyright was so that people would continue to create instead of resting on their laurels. This would be implemented by having the character be free of copyright after 28 years, in which the property would go into the magical little field called the public domain. At this point, the character would be free for use by anyone for whatever purpose they saw fit. This is actually how several characters like Pinocchio, Cinderella, Tarzan, and Peter Pan got so popular. Anyone can and has used them as a part of the public domain, so it can infinitely evolve. This was how things worked for a long time. After the copyright period ended, it would encourage the author, who's gotten plenty of money at this point, to create another piece of media and in the end further add to the public zeitgeist. You may have also noticed that the public domain characters I mentioned were indeed made into Disney films. In fact, a large portion of Disney's animated catalog encompasses public domain characters. You'd think that since Disney took from the public domain so often, they'd be happy to reinvest in it with some of their characters, but you'd be very wrong, my friend. Mickey Mouse, at least in the form of Steamboat Willie, was created in 1928. So with, at the time, 56 years for copyright protection, he was originally going to enter the public domain in 1984. Disney didn't want that for their precious mascot, however, so they pressured Congress to change copyright laws in 1976 to include the creator's entire life plus 50 years after their death. And for older works, the status went up from 56 years to 75, so Disney's Precious Mouse would now not be for public use until 2003. Lo and behold, when that date was getting closer, Disney lobbied Congress again in 1998 with the Sonny Bono Act to make it an author's life plus 70 years, so now the oldest version of Mickey is finally set to be released to the public in 2023. And because the outrage has been so massive over the years, Disney can't extend the deadline anymore without severe backlash. Even if they can't can't extend the deadline anymore, they've completely fucked up the idea of copyright as a whole. Now, not only does this process not encourage copyright holders to continue making characters and stories after the previous has been allowed to the public, but it basically makes it impossible for us to have any characters from the past 100 fucking years to use for our own stories. We could have had Xenomorphs, Indiana Jones, and Captain Kirk for public use by now, but instead we can still only use the same characters Disney was using back in the days before they messed up the system they ended up profiting off of. Disney and other companies in the modern age might say they're taking down fan films of old properties and love letters to a series to help the creator, but most of the time the creator is long dead and can no longer profit off it. You know who can profit off it? The corporations that own the property. Yep, Disney's main mascot might be a mouse, but under the surface they're nothing more than a bunch of greedy rats. What was once used as a source of creativity and inspiration for others to create and evolve media has turned into a corporate monopoly so so big companies can now play innocent and say that they're just helping the creators when they're the only ones profiting. Disney made it happen this way, and it only goes to show the depths of their hypocrisy to the core. Okay, so Disney is a bunch of money-hungry hypocrites to take from the public domain, yet have fucked it up really badly to the point it would take years of lobbying to recover. Do they at least use their copyright in a fair and just way? Well, you're watching this video, so I bet you can guess that isn't the case. When it came to Star Wars, considering the big fan base, eventually a YouTuber by the name of Star Wars Theory wanted to create an independent fan short called Vader. They went to Lucasfilm, owned by Disney, to ask if they could do it, and the company said he could, but only if he didn't get it crowdfunded, used wholly original assets, and he never monetized the video. Pretty steep demands considering how high quality he wanted to make the short film, but whatever, he did it. It got super popular too. And would you look at that, Lucasfilm manually struck it down. Their reason was that it included a cover of one of the Star Wars songs. So now not only were they not not allowing him to make money off it, they were also making money off the project themselves for doing nothing and making him create it with no help. There also was no cover song. The video was 100% originally scored, but nonetheless, the claim was never lifted. The man was so passionate about creating a Star Wars fan film to the point he went along with Disney's insane demands. But then they come out of nowhere with a false claim, and if he tried to go to court about it, he'd probably still end up losing despite doing nothing
something wrong. So he was backed into letting them profit off his work. Can't get any scummier, can they? <laughs> you fool! You know Spider-Man? Well, a four-year-old child knew and loved Spider-Man before he was tragically killed by a genetic disease. He loved the superhero so much that his family paid for his funeral to include a horse-drawn carriage with red and blue balloons. Their one final request for him was asking Disney if they could include Spider-Man on their child's tombstone. They refused. The reason? From the company, they said it was to protect the innocence and magic of the characters. You know, Disney, the company that has had plenty of death in their films, including but not limited to being crushed by a boulder, getting stabbed by a sword, accidentally hanging themselves, caught in a twirling blade, falling off a balcony into a ravine, falling off a clock tower, falling off a waterfall, blowing up at a fireworks stand, being pulled down to hell by demons, and rapidly aging before falling out of a tower and being turned to dust. Na 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 na! Or maybe they mean the innocence of Spider Man, a character that has died in many comic books, in movies, in TV shows, and on one occasion killed Mary Jane with his radioactive semen. Yes, that is a thing. Na 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 na! If we're being honest here, cutting all the humor, there's no reason they shouldn't have been able to fulfill such a small request, and the fact they didn't is quite scummy of them. Oh, they also did allow this to happen with Iron Man. I guess they didn't want to pull the same card for an alcoholic playboy that actually died even in their universe. And I think that's all I have to say. We sure covered a lot today. Day, from hypocrisy, to compromising of morals, to oversaturation of multiple markets, to ruining the idea of copyright, to soullessly reshelling old properties without knowing what made them good, to corporate mediocrity. I hope with all of this on the table, we can try to at least expect more from our entertainment. If a company is using a sexuality to try and gain publicity for their movie without properly representing it, don't stand for it. If a company films next to a place that could be seen as committing genocide and thanking people contributing to it, don't stand for it. If a company is oversaturating an industry with subpar content when you know they could do better, talk about it. If you see a company trying to use the law to their advantage, don't let them just get away with it. In the end, I don't expect people to boycott Disney or anything. They take up a large portion of the entertainment industry, so shunning them is like shunning half your family. It won't work out. All I ask is that when you see an injustice by them, you feel free to talk about it, no matter how big a corporation they may be. I'll still watch Pixar movies and Guardians of the Galaxy and go to Disney World if the opportunity presents itself, but just knowing about all this and deciding to try and do something about it is enough to start the wheels of change. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you all in the next one. Oh, and if I see a comment about Kimba the White Line in this fucking comment section, I swear to god- I mean, just the name is similar. Kimba? Simba? Mmm, suspicious.